Good evening. I call to order this meeting of the Washington County Board of Education. And we do have a quorum present this evening. We have with us tonight Jordan Miles, who is a fourth grade student at Williamsport Elementary School. And Jordan will be leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. Jordan? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Hello, Jordan. Thank you for being with us this evening. Do you have some guests with you tonight that you would like to introduce to us? Mm -hmm. Would you do that for us, please? That's my mom. She teaches third grade. That's my sister, and that's my dad. And I that's my homeroom, and that's my principal. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, and thank you for being here in support of Jordan for bringing her this evening. So Jordan, you're a fourth grade student at Williamsport Elementary School. Can you tell us something about uh, your day at Williamsport? Well, I like to read and write and like I like to read independently in reading. That's wonderful. Do you have a particular genre that you like to read? Do you like certain books or a certain author? Um, like historical fiction. Oh, okay. That's wonderful. I hope you'll keep reading. That's a wonderful pastime. Is there anything that you do after school that you'd like to share with us? Any hobbies or areas of interest? I am a pitcher in softball. Oh, you are. And I am learning to be a pitcher. Wonderful. But do you have a team? Do you play on a team? Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> you can't remember the name? I played on Farmhouse Stitches last year. Uh-huh. And I don't know this year. And don't know this year? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's great. Colleagues, do you have anything you'd like to ask Jordan? Jordan, do you have any pets? Yes, I have a cat and a hedgehog. Hedgehog. <laughs> Could you tell us about the hedgehog? Well, the hedgehog is my sister's. Oh. <laughs> um, and she takes good care of it, and we take good care of the cat. Do you have to use special gloves when you hold the hedgehog? No. Wow. Any other questions for Jordan? Well, Jordan, thank you again for being here and for leading us in the pledge in the moment of silence. Good luck to you and your studies, school. Thank you so much. Okay, we will approve tonight's agenda. Is there a motion for approval? Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. All in favor of approving tonight's agenda? Okay, we're unanimous, and the student member concurs. Um, we'll have approval of the minutes, please. Madam President. I move that we approved the closed session minutes dated Saturday, December 8, 2018. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Gessert. Any additions or corrections to? the December 8th closed session minutes. Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of approval? Okay, we're unanimous. Madam President. I move for the approval of the of compliance checklist for meetings subject to the Maryland Open Meetings Act. Minutes dated Saturday, December 8th, 2018. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Is there a second? Second. 
Thank you, Mr. Gessford. Any additions or corrections? All those in favor of that set of minutes? Approval? Okay, we're unanimous. Approval? I move for the approval of the closed session minutes dated Tuesday, December 11th, 2018. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Any additions or corrections to the December 11th closed session minutes? All those in favor of approval? Okay, unanimous. Motion carries. Madam President, I move for the approval of business meeting minutes dated Tuesday, December 11th, 2018. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Any additions or correction to the December 11th business meeting minutes? Okay, all those in favor of approval? We're unanimous and the student member concurs. And I move for the approval of work session minutes dated Tuesday, December 18th, 2018. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Stahl. For any addition or corrections to the work session minutes of December 8th? Oh, no. I'm no? Ready to vote. You're ready to vote? <laughs> okay. All those in favor of approval of those minutes? Thank you. Extension. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five. Affirmative, one abstention, and the student member concurs. Thank you. Our next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Dr. Michael. Thank you, President Williams. Uh, as, most of, <coughs> as all of you are aware, earlier today we had our groundbreaking at Sharpsburg Elementary School. Uh, it was an excellent day. It was a great kickoff to... Uh, a Tuesday in January, the weather cooperated. We had just a wonderful celebration. I just want to bring that to people's attention. But tonight, our first part of our presentation for the superintendent's report is recognition of our advanced placement scholars. And at this point, I'd like to call on Dr. Jessica Reinhardt to come forward just to share a little bit about the program uh, and the various levels of recognition. And then in just a few minutes, we're going to ask the board members to go down front and we're going to recognize our students that are here this evening and uh, we'll rotate as we go through the various schools to allow each board member an opportunity to, to share with people. Good evening, Madam President, Mr. Stauffer, Dr. Michael, board members, advanced placement scholars, and guests. This evening, I'm honored to celebrate Washington County Public Schools advanced placement scholars during this inaugural reception and board recognition event. Advanced placement, or AP classes as they are known by our students and educators, is a college board program that was designed to give students the experience of taking introductory level college classes while they are still in high school. Completion of these rigorous courses can enable a student to receive college credit if they pass the associated exams. Exam scores range from one to five. A score of three is considered passing. It is one thing to take the AP course, but it is certainly another to prepare for, take, and pass the associated cumulative exam. The students we are recognizing this evening are known to us as athletes, artists, employees, volunteers, and of course, teenagers. They are academic scholars also. That is, they wear many hats, they juggle multiple activities, and they remain committed to their coursework. They have taken several advanced placement classes and other rigorous coursework, some as early as grade nine. It is the accumulation of multiple passing scores that designates a student as an AP scholar. Tonight, we are recognizing multiple tiers of AP scholars. A total of 98 current sophomores, juniors, and seniors were named as AP scholars based on the coursework and the testing during the 27-2018 school year. And I, if I could call your attention to the two screens, the one screen is up here, the other screen is over on the side. Parents who are joining us from the Downsville Cafe and the Hagerstown room, I'd like to direct you to the reverse side of the green 
card stock page that you received upon entry. The tiers are as follows. AP Scholar describes those students who received scores of three or higher on three or more AP exams. AP Scholar with Honor describes students who have received an average score of at least 3.25 on all exams taken and have scores of three or higher on four or more of those exams. AP Scholar with Distinction describes those students who received an average score of at least 3.5 on all exams taken and have scores of three or higher on five or more of these exams. And finally, National AP Scholar. Typically for us, this describes those students who were graduating seniors last year. These are the students in the United States who received an average score of at least four on all AP exams taken and have scores of four or higher on eight or more of these exams. So we are really pleased to have families, our principals, and our students joining us this evening. Now the students are going to be called by school to receive their certificates of recognition. They are organized alphabetically by AP Scholar tier and we are asking that they remain at the front of the room after they receive their certificate to have their picture taken with the school principal and our board members. This time, board members, if you'd move down front, please. So we're going to begin with Barbara Ingram School for the Arts. The following students were designated as AP Scholars. Sydney Bach. Kathleen Thompson. And Principal Rob Havermail, if you want to join your students. Congratulations, students. Our next group of students are from Boonesboro High School. Beginning with students who were designated as AP Scholars. Elizabeth Gaver. Shakina Kurapati. Lauren Moore. Also from Boonesboro High School. AP Scholar with Distinction, Andrew Hartman. And if Dr. Kahanek would join his students. Thank you. 
Congratulations, students. Clear Spring High School, AP Scholars, Kirsten Barnhart, Kaylee Molina, Celia Ramashati, Clear Spring High School, AP Scholar with Honor, Rachel Cornwell, and Paige Seibert. Joining them is Principal Megan Burton. Congratulations, students. <laughs> Hancock Middle Senior High School, AP Scholar with Distinction, Kayla Wood. And Principal Sabrina McCoy will join her. Congratulations. <laughs> North Hagerstown High School, beginning with AP Scholars, Lauren Asbury, Stephen Sermeno. Bossman Awusu Ayi, Sierra Tostin, North Hagerstown High School AP Scholar with Honor, Megan Alshire. And joining the students will be Principal James Alshire. Congratulations, students. <laughs> Smithsburg High School. AP Scholar with Honor, Nathan Hartney. And joining Nathan is Principal Gary Willow. Thank <laughs> you. 
Congratulations. <laughs> South Hagerstown High School, AP Scholars, Emily Alexander. Kayla Diaz. Talia Hodges. Cole Rhodes. South Hagerstown High School, AP Scholar with Honor, Patience Moses. South Hagerstown High School, AP Scholar with Distinction, Madeline Blash. Also, an AP Scholar with Distinction, Holly McAndrew. And joining the students, Principal Jeremy Jacoby. Congratulations, students. <laughs> Washington County Technical High School. AP Scholar with Honor, Tyler Adkins. AP Scholar with Honor, Alexander Wizdala. and AP Scholar with Honor, Crystal Martinez. And joining the students is Mr. Rodney Gaiman, Principal. students and from Williamsport High School AP scholar with honor Sarah Herbert AP scholar William Wood Williamsport High School AP scholar with honor Monica Becker And joining them, Principal Dr. Heath Wilcox.
Congratulations, students. Thank you. And thank you, families, for joining us. report for right now. We'll have some other information a little bit later in the program. I think it was absolutely worth that time to recognize our AP scholars and that was only a fraction of our students that won their awards. We have a lot of students participating tonight in other events and couldn't make it. So we want to thank them for coming. Thank you Dr. Michael. <coughs> At this time we'll have public comment and we have two citizens signed up to speak during public comment. Before I call them forward, I'd like to read from Board Policy KD with regard to procedures for board business meetings. Each person wishing to address the Board of Education is encouraged but not required to sign up prior to the meeting and may address any topic concerning Washington County Public Schools except personnel or student matters which clearly identify an individual or individuals. Each speaker may speak for up to five minutes. And Mr. Bickford is our official timekeeper. So he'll show you a yellow sign. And 30 seconds left. And the red stop sign. So at this time I'd like to call forward Angeli Spann. Am I pronouncing that right? Good evening. Wherever you're comfortable. Hello. Thank you guys so much for your time. My name is Angelie Spann. I am here in representation for the team basketball moms of South Hagerstown High School, as well as a representative for our student section, AKA the Rebellion, <laughs> which is our student body. Okay, I just want to read the composed letter that us mothers put together. As proud rebel parents and students, we are coming together to communicate our disappointment and frustration with recent decisions pertaining to our student athletes during our North and South basketball game. Our players, students, and fans experienced an alarming event this past weekend at our school. We are bringing this issue to your attention because we feel we find the actions we're taking are deeply problematic and disconjoining dis con, discouraging to the very athletes who work hard and play their best to represent our school to the best of their abilities memories are made during our high school years ones that will last a lifetime we are fearful our children and their mental health were not advanced nor supported during such a memorable time in their lives the goal of this communication is to share this concerning feelings so that we may come to a common ground in order to avoid any similar issues in the future. Since 1956, South Hagerstown High School has been dedicated to the service of its youth and community. Still today, rebels strive to maintain this legacy. As one of the basketball parents at South, I am proud of the commitment, dedication, and bond that has formed amongst our players. Our students and our fans. One example of our bond is our weekly no phone dinner tradition created by team parents, Beth, Kelly, Holly, and myself. Similarly, we have installed a spirit of community service in our players. Some players referee basketball games at the YMCA together. Others have participated in a Christmas play with special needs children. We even drove to Bowie, Maryland in support of one of our players who was invited to play in the Crab Bowl. Our children have fostered a special relationship outside of the game. They share this bond not only amongst themselves, 
but also with the student body. Their loyal school spirit exudes in an almost electric way. We are proud of the mixture of our students, alumni, and parents who share a collective sense of honor in their rebel identity. Our largest rival game, where South plays against the North, is one of our most memorable games of the year. The home section that night was moved to a small area in the corner. By changing the seating of our student section, we gave away the benefit of our home field advantage and deprived our students a chance to make lasting memories. As a whole, we are striving for school spirit. This is not what we experienced the other night. Conversely, we do not condone the home section swearing and we understand changes are necessary to create an atmosphere for all involved. However, we feel that the decision to move the entire student section was extreme and unwarranted. There could have been compromise involving the student section to meet the collective goals of unity and safety without moving them and their section that has been in place for several seasons. Our rebel family was just confined to a small corner and we feel that this is no way to treat your rebel family. Next, our student section was blocked by the police. This was by far the most demoralizing decision of the evening. Our students were supervised by the police as if they were inmates in a correctional facility and or defendants in a courtroom. The police presence in front of them created an atmosphere of mistrust and complete lack of confidence in our students and their integrity. While our student section does get rowdy and we are excited and unfortunately they do use foul language on occasion which we in no way condone or support. They have, ex they have in no way exhibited characteristics of common criminals. The police supervision constituted a deplorable means of calming an excited crowd a crowd who takes pride in their school. We need to use level heads to come to an understanding for the benefits of our players, fans, and parents. We have accomplished great strides in changing the negative public perception of our school. All we seek is to continue the progress as a community. And we want the support of the administration, the athletic director, our students and our playings for their well-being and for the benefit of our community. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Parker. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. For those who don't know me, I'm John Croker from Boonesboro, Maryland. I wish to congratulate all involved in today's groundbreaking for the new Sharpsburg Elementary School. I hope that the community and the board will support plans for a learning garden to be included in the design. School gardens have been shown at many locations to be an excellent and motivating educational tool that augments existing uh, curricula in a variety of subjects. As I saw many school and county officials at the groundbreaking with shovels today, I couldn't help but think of the many graves for young people that have needed to be dug in Washington County due to the opioid epidemic. The Washington County Public Schools must do better for our children uh, in educating them about drugs and substance abuse. For too long, the Washington County Public Schools have merely checked the box for having a small segment of the health curriculum devoted to drug education. Not all drug educational programs are created equal and are equally effective. The Washington County Public Schools urgently needs to research and implement models that have been shown uh, to have a positive effect. Metrics need to be included in any program to determine if the Washington County Public Schools are moving the needle 
or just spinning the wheels. Annual surveys could be implemented to track attitudes and behaviors as well as knowledge of facts. More trained counselors, psychologists, and social services for students and their families who are impacted by substance abuse are needed. Our county and state representatives can be enlisted to provide financial and other support for improvements in drug education and assistance in Washington County. I hope that when you and other officials raise shovels at future groundbreaking events, you will remember the young lives we've lost in Washington County and strive to do better. It's a matter of life and death. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Croca. Is there anyone else who'd like to come forward and speak during public comment? Okay. We'll now have board member response to comment. Any of my colleagues? I'd just like to thank you for coming in. I'm, I'm sure you wrote that as a team, but I thought that was uh, very eloquently said. And uh, I, I won't speak on what will be done about it, but I'm sure it'll be. I appreciate that you came and gave your voice to that. Yeah. I echo Mr. Bickford's remarks. Thank you, Mrs. Spann. Thank you. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Dr. Akers, to, to meet with you for a few minutes, if you have a few minutes here at the end of the meeting. He's the gentleman uh, the back. Sorry, Dr. Akers, but the gentleman, the gray hair in the back. <laughs> 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 And glasses, baby. Uh, which one? Former, yeah, which one? The one on the In the back, in the back. Uh, former principal of South High, and I think Mr. Tricopi is still here as well. So it might be a good opportunity to go ahead and, and, you know, go out and step out in the hallway and have a conversation about your concern. We appreciate the students and their enthusiasm and the parents at South High, and I'm sure the administration does as well. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, our next item on the agenda, old business, and we have none, so we'll move right on to new business. And the first item is tonight's consent agenda. Mr. Bakedel. Uh, good evening, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Michael. Tonight I have five items for your review. These items were reviewed by our purchasing review committee and are being recommended for approval and staff is available if you have any questions. Thank you. Is there a motion? Madam President, I move to approve the awards, renewals, and procurements for maintenance and repair of mechanical and refrigeration equipment to MTS equipment at a cost of $34,140 and to Thai Construction Company, Inc. at a cost of $54,000. Mobile device management for Apple products to JAMF at a cost of $69,834. Network security assessment to Securance Consulting at a cost of $52,496. Professional development for Math Tech Book to Discovery Education at a cost of $67,400. And repair the chiller at Smithsburg High School to Johnson Controls, Inc at a cost of $63,710. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Oh, OK. It was a tie. I'll take Mrs. Murray, if you don't mind, Mr. Right now. I'll get you, I'll get you on the next motion. Thank you. All right. Any discussion, any questions for Mr. Bakedal? No? Okay, and then we'll move to the vote. All those in favor of approving tonight's consent agenda, raise your hand. Okay, we're unanimous. Student member concurs, and the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next item of business is a donation from Fountaindale Elementary PTA. Good evening, Absolutely. Dr. Palmer. Good evening. President Williams, Dr. Michael, and board members. I am requesting approval of a gift of $5,401.25 to Fountaindale Elementary from their PTA. The funds will be used to support teachers with the Chesapeake on the Bay classroom experiences. Thank you. Is there a motion? I move to 
make a donation in the amount of $5,401.25 from the Fountaindale Elementary PTA to Fountaindale Elementary School. Thank you, Mr. Is second. there a second? Who is that, Mr. Gessford? Is that you? Mr. Gessford. Thank you for the second. Any questions for Dr. Palmer? Any discussion? Add that my wife in Frederick County did a, uh, went on that journey at the Chesapeake Bay and still talks about it. And that was probably about four or five years ago. It's a very good program. Dr. Palmer, please convey our thanks to the PTA at Fountaindale for their generosity, making this experience possible for the students there. So we need to have a vote <laughs> on the motion to approve this wonderful donation. All those in favor? All right, we're unanimous and the student member concurs. Motion carries. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. Okay, next up is Mr. Pru. Good evening, Mrs. Williams, Dr. Michael, members of the board. Staff presented to you a slate of individuals for approval on a Board of Education Advisory Committee. Uh, and we're uh, asking your approval of that slate this evening. Thank you. Is there a motion? Madam President, I move to approve the proposed candidates for membership on one of the Board of Education Advisory Committees. Thank you, Mr. Bridgeford. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Any questions? Any discussion? All right, we'll move right to the vote. All those in favor of approving the proposed candidates for membership on one of the Board's Advisory Committee Committees. Mr. Rodner, your hand? Yeah, you okay. So we're unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pruitt. And next up is Dr. Bishop with consideration of the proposed academic year calendars. Good evening. Good evening. At this time, on behalf of the calendar committee, we would uh, like to seek your approval for the academic calendars. As you know, the calendar committee is one of the board's advisory committees. We are 16 members this year, including representatives from teachers, parents, ESP, administrators, and students on our board, on our advisory board. And uh, we, of course, have to follow for the calendar uh, governor's executive orders, uh, the Code of Maryland regulations, as well as our negotiated agreements with all of our uh, unit employees. So we have drafts before you and we're seeking your approval. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. Is there a motion? Madam President, I move to approve the proposed academic year calendar for 2019-2020. Thank you, Mr. Bickford. Is there a second? Second. That was Mr. Gessard? Yes. Okay. <coughs> Questions or discussion? Mr. Ridenow. Yeah. <clears throat> I know we're looking at the result of the executive order. Um, what's the, just out of curiosity, what's the last day this year, assuming we have how many days, how many snow days do we have at the end of the year? I have it at my fingertips, and I don't want to misspeak, but the um, I think we're up to June. Somebody help me. Six or seven? Seven. Seven uh, is where we are right now. Our county ha calendar hasn't moved for students because we've made that adjustment here in the January calendar. Right. Um, we have allowed for several snow days in the calendar, which could take us as far as June 15th. There was some legislation that allows us to go to June 21st, and there is a possibility that we would have to go that late if we had an extended number, of, an extensive number of snow days. My question would be, <coughs> excuse me, is there any thought to, I know we're looking at the January day this year, any thought that if we start having snow days, and we've been lucky for the last few years, that's, you know, sooner or later, things catch up to you, but is there any thought of um, setting up earlier snow days? You know, in other words, put it in, say, okay, if we have a snow day before Thanksgiving, we'll take one day, you know, shortly, maybe up from the Thanksgiving break or, or the Christmas break or early in January. We get our second one is our the thought of process of having a day that we can pluck out of uh, so that we don't go to the 15th or 16th 
if at all possible. Certainly would be our desire, and we have identified in this year's calendar some possible days we could do that with. This was one of the first possible days we could do that with. The challenge sometimes becomes the way you weigh what you'll gain in June against what you'll lose by taking some of these days. So this day we thought was a good day to take here, and I know we're a little off topic of this calendar, but in the current calendar, this January day I think we'll have excellent attendance. It'll be a very productive day or a day in June. It's possible we could pick a day. Um, you know, President's Day or some day when a lot of people are off and suddenly be with 60% attendance. So we will do that strategically. We have identified some days this year. We will watch that. Uh, my desire would be to get out as absolute early in June as possible and make the days productive. But over a million dollars a day, uh, I believe we absolutely have to make every day productive, whether it's during the calendar year and in June. So we'll continue to watch that. This calendar, I think, identifies some possible days that we'd also take um, in addition to the four days that are built in as possible snow days. I think it would be prudent to let parents, families know as early as possible, these are days that we will use. I mean, they're there. We, can, You and I can read them and we read them because right. we, you know, we work with them all the time. But letting parents and, and families know ahead of time, okay, if we get a snow day in, in December or November, or even October, we had one, I think, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a day we we will probably use to rectify that situation. I just think, it, you know, if parents and families know well enough ahead of time, there's a very good chance that this might happen. We will use these before we add things on at the end of the year. It's just a thought on my part. Yeah, because I don't I, know what I, their attendance rate is. My grandsons go to school in Greencastle, and they're constantly changing their calendar. Of course, that's a fairly small district and, you know, affects four or five schools. But they, they make up days almost immediately. Yeah, like I, think that. That, I think that it makes sense, boy, to mm -hmm. Dr. Mike. When we, sure. when we had the early snow day, we thought for a moment about the day before Thanksgiving, but it was just too short a notice. I think it was actually the week before. We just felt like it was too short a notice, or we probably would have considered that day this year. But we will continue to do that this year and in future calendars. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ridenow. Anyone else? Okay, so the motion is to approve the proposed academic year calendar for 2019 through 2020. All those in favor? Okay, unanimous, and the student member concurs. Motion carries. Thank you. If I could, I'd just like to take a moment to talk about the 1920-21 calendar. Absolutely. Um, of course, we need to start school at this time after Labor Day, and Labor Day falls September 7th in 2020, which means we would not begin school until September 8th. The calendar committee did the very best that they could, and school ends that year on that proposed calendar. I believe it's June 14th, and there's one makeup day. So we really are hoping that there will be some consideration at the state level because of that calendar. Um, so uh, I think to hold on and see if there is a change, uh, the calendar committee understands that. And uh, we, we definitely have looked at if there is a change, uh, an alternative calendar, and we would be prepared for that. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. Mr. Stafford. Uh, yesterday I attended the Maryland Association Boards of Education <clears throat> legislative committee meeting in Annapolis, and uh, one of the things that was uh, on the agenda was the fact that uh, Mabe has written a bill that, in a nutshell, the gist of it is it will return uh, authority over the school calendar to the uh, local education agencies. And uh, the bill is has been in the hands of Senator King and Delegate Lukey, whose uh, committees or subcommittees will handle the bill. Uh, so it's very possible that if this bill gets traction and gets passed that uh, there may have to be adjustments maybe to next year's calendar too as a result of this bill if we choose to do so. Thank you. President Williams, I think based on that information, staff would recommend we delay action on this calendar until maybe sometime in April. Thank you, Dr. Michael. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Bishop. Our next item on the agenda is consideration of board member standing committee assignments. Um, 
The recommended board member standing committees are as follows. Curriculum and instruction, Linda Murray will chair that committee. Michael Gessard and myself will be the members. On the facilities committee, we have Michael Gessert as chairman, Wayne Ridenauer and Stan Stauffer as committee members. The finance committee, we have Peter Vickford as chairman with Linda Murray and Stan Stauffer as members of the committee. For the human resources committee, we have Wayne Ridenauer as chairman, Jacqueline Fisher and Peter Bickford as members of the committee. And the Policy Review and Development Committee, we have Jacqueline Fisher as Chairwoman, Stan Stauffer, and Melissa Williams as committee members. Is there a motion? President Williams, I move that we, where is it? Approve. approve. Thank, Thank you. you. The committee recommendations. Thank you, Mrs. Murray. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Stauffer. Any discussion? Any questions? Okay, we'll move to the vote. All those in favor of approving the recommended standing committee assignments? Yes, we're unanimous, and the student member concurs. Thank you. And next, we have a continuation of the superintendent's report. So, Dr. Michael, back to you. Thank you, President Williams. <clears throat> we ask the North High team to come forward. Uh, as the board's aware, last year we approved uh, Chromebook Pilot and we used North High as our pilot school. Uh, Chromebooks were purchased for every student in the school and the teachers. And we wanted to bring the board a mid-year report on the progress of the implementation of the Chromebook. Um, we'll have some other information on some other technology opportunities as we move forward here in the, the coming months. But uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Alshare and his team. Uh, if you can introduce everybody, Mr. Alshare. And Take it from here. Thank you. Good evening. Um, we have Lisa Scumpiero, Becky Higgins, Airy, and Dr. Kara Burhans here this evening. Um, we're going to give an update on the Chromebook pilot at North Eggerstown High School. So we initiated the Chromebook pilot. Um, between the months of June and July uh, when it was decided that the pilot would begin. Um, so we started the review of Chrome, uh, the Chromebook settings and having staff come in to pick up their Chromebooks. We had approximately 50 teachers who picked up devices prior to school starting. Uh, we thought it was important for them to be able to have devices in their hands um, early so that they could be acclimated with it, understand uh, the ins and outs of the device. Uh, and then we could also provide some professional development as well. Uh, we also did some casting professional development, which we delivered to our tech team, uh, was delivered by the tech team, and that's the ability for students and teachers to be able to use their device mobile within the classroom and to project on the screen so that students and uh, staff could share. Um, we had Chromebook distribution that started in September for all students. We were a little bit behind where we were from our iPad distribution only because of devices and making sure um, that we were ready to go uh, with getting everything out. We, our tech team has met constantly throughout the process and then in October we did Go Guardian training. Uh, that is the ability like with the iPad you could use the Apple Classroom. Go Guardian provides kind of the same kind of management but in a Chromebook world. Um, and then on November 6th on our professional development day we did uh, professional development in-house led by staff within the building uh, on Go Guardian casting Jamboard grade cam and the entire G suite uh, professional development. I would also like to recognize uh, Lisa was an English teacher at North Hagerstown High School. Uh, she's since moved over into the technology department, but Lisa and Becky both were instrumental in our G suite training with our entire staff prior to the Chromebook implementation. Uh, we actually did that as part of our iPad implementation um, because we thought it was a good route for our students and our, our uh, staff to be able to share information back and forth utilizing Google Classroom and the entire G Suite uh, as a whole. So at the time that I made this presentation was for the December um, presentation and then it was delayed. 
Um, I would say that it, it says nearly every educator is able to cast student work. I would say every educator. Um, if you see the picture, is very small on the right there. It does show Joy Malcolm in her classroom casting student work. Um, they were doing a lab and the student casted their work up there. But we have over 1,300 student Chromebooks and 106 staff Chromebooks. And so it's nice to see that graphic to sort of see the staff. Um, at, you know, there's a small percentage, but when you see some of the numbers of the usage, to keep that in mind, because it's the students that are really, you know, and, the, and the staff that are using their Chromebooks. And I just want to add, uh, when we say the word cast, that's a Google term. Many of you would know it as the word mirror. If you cast from your device onto your television or any other device, it allows you to be mobile. It allows you to quickly access one thing on a device and put it up there, whether it be to help someone see something more attractive, more visually accessible. It allows students to project their own work up there immediately so other students can see, and it's an instructable instruction moment that's really important. And it allows teachers to be mobile as they're instructing, because they can move slides across the screen or their work without having to race up to the front of the classroom. And many of you probably remember that, either as students or as teachers. So I just wanted to clarify the word CAST for you. For our professional learning supports that we've put in place, uh, probably one of the most instrumental pieces of what we have been able to do has been our tech team. Um, the tech team's been instrumental in moving not only our students, but also our staff. Uh, they've done a great job. We've pro they've provided the in-house professional development, and we've kind of listened to what our teachers are asking that they need, providing that for professional development, and then allowing them to be able to use, and then also be a resource to them. Uh, so that has been been very very important uh, for us. We have gone with a train the trainer model. So Lisa has been able to come in. She has worked with the tech team, and then we've utilized the tech team, which are teachers within the building, uh, someone from each area in the building, who then serves as a train the trainer for the rest of the staff. And that's been a great model. I've been able to make PD modules come up with how these areas casting go guardian stylus can be used in the classroom with the chromebook and then the trainers from those areas from the departments go out and they're able to train their department and also um, what's nice when i did the stylus it really made them understand this could work for the math department i'm going to go back and show this part to the math department so it was nice because they had that pulse on their department the functionality, you know, at, at the heart of everything we do has been student work. It's been the focal point of everything that we do. Um, you know, I would say GoGuardian has probably been one of the nicest uh, additions along with the Chromebook because it does allow for classroom management uh, for the teachers. Teachers can, you know, see what is happening on the student's device in real time. They can also manage the device in the sense of how many tabs are opened and what tabs are open. So that's been a great addition uh, as a result of having the Chromebook. The other addition that's been really nice for us is we not only did we get Chromebooks, we also got Chrome bits, uh, which are hooked to everybody's um, LCD projectors, and that's allowed a lot of functionality for teachers uh, to be able to utilize different things throughout the classroom. And then, of course, the stylus training has also been important. And I would also say we're just going to go into the apps training, but with the Chromebook, a lot has been found where they don't need a lot of apps. They've asked for several that we've given them, but they can also use a lot of extensions and add-ons because they have the Chromebook. And a lot of our stuff has been trial has been trial and error. Uh, so the next slide I think shows that it's a current level of implementation. Have you tried any level of casting in your classroom? And as you can see, we're about 90% of staff has at least tried it, uh, is trying it, is instituting it, uh, and is trying to make it work. And I think we're still in that trial by. Um, kind of just doing and talking and communicating. We had a tech meeting prior to this meeting this evening, and we were talking about what are our next steps? What are the things that we need to do for staff for professional development uh, within the, the initiative itself? 
Uh, this slide also kind of gives you current level of implementation. Uh, this is information that we get from GoGuardian. Actually, I get a report each day uh, that tells me which teachers are using GoGuardian, who is utilizing it, and where are they. Uh, this slide kind of breaks it down where you can see 39.4% of students are in Docs. Uh, they're in Google Docs. And then it breaks it down all the way down to exactly in the other areas that they are. So if they're in Classroom or if they're in um, Edpuzzle, uh, Quizlet, when we were in the PreviLearn site, I knew that we were doing what we, what we needed to be doing because PreviLearn came up as a small snippet of uh, where people should be and what they should be doing at the time. And this is kind of really a snapshot of a day in the life of North High and what is happening in regard to technology. Um, ongoing and future efforts, I'm going to turn this over and let Becky kind of talk a little bit about this from a sense of where we are from, um, from the tech team. Uh, she's been instrumental in leading that team. So at the beginning of the year, with Lisa's support, we made a plan of how to logically transition everybody at various levels. So obviously getting acquainted with the Chromebook was really important as it was a new device. If you've used a laptop, that part necessarily wasn't new. It was how the Chromebook is a, is a mobile device, is all the way connected to the internet and operates a little bit differently than that. So it was important to start with casting because, again, like I mentioned, that added the mobility factor and the opportunity to add a little bit of a different way of instructing students and working with students. GoGuardian, that was rolled out very quickly. In fact, they were almost ro rolled out simultaneously. Over the, over the summer, teachers had the option if they wanted to go through an online training of their own, and then we offered that again in the beginning of the year, and then we offered it yet again in, in November. And that was really important because they, the Chromebooks and GoGuardian go hand in hand. Having a management device was really important uh, that allowed a, sort of for you to structure, instruct, structure instruction, help direct, help lead students. So that was done very quickly. As far as the stylist training, of course, students and teachers were already using stylist per se. Now, mind you, when I say stylist, the teachers have something that's a little more advanced because of the level of the work that we would do. Students have their finger or a phone tip stylist of their choice. So we're right now in the middle of the stylist training, and really what that looks like is Lisa introducing certain applications in which a stylist would be used. So, for example, one of the things that we, right now, as a tech team, were trained on was how to do a screen recording, which would have been quick time in the iPad world. You can record a lot of things. You can record yourself doing a model lesson. You could, students can record themselves analyzing a text and talking about it, and then they can go back and use a stylist to annotate it and do all kinds of things to that. Uh, you can also grade using a stylus. That's something important for teachers. So we're right now, we're on target in that way, and we'll be spending January with the tech team is, is fine-tuning that, and we'll be rolling that out then in February. And then apps is really ongoing, right? Any app that a teacher has used as an iPad that's available to us now, we're using maybe in a different way because we have more capabilities with it, but then we are also exploring other apps that we weren't able to use to full functionality on an iPad device and seeing how that can uh, benefit us even more so. So that will be an ongoing process, and, but that will be probably in stronger force at the end of the year. And I will say that right now North High is ready to actually do some feedback surveys we are planning to survey with our students and with the staff to collect some of the data we would like mid-year regarding the pilot so that we all can talk about where we are and where we need to go and a component of that survey uh, particularly with staff is then looking at where do we go next steps with our ongoing professional development so a, a component of that will be um, self-identified need for growth um, in moving forward with their Chromebook implementation and then what we'll do for the remainder of the year um, we have four hours for each staff member that we'll be using through a grant for them to um, engage in professional development staff would be glad to take any questions this is kind of a mid-year report so I don't think we're ready to uh, 
you know, proclaim one way or the other uh, where we are with Chromebooks and the future uh, here in Washington County, but I'm sure they'd be glad to entertain any questions if somebody had something to see them. Questions? Mr. Pickford? How, um, so many of you, I guess, had time, have had plenty of time working with the iPads previously, correct? What are some benefits? What are some, what, what do you miss? The functionality is essentially the same for both. Um, just you have different, you don't have the Apple apps mm -hmm. applications on the Chromebook, but we have comparable ones that go ahead and coincide with it. And am I right, so these flip so they can be like an iPad, but they're also, a, they're also a, have a pretty, okay. Yeah, so it has both forward, it has a camera that does both, has both functionality. Uh, you can use it as a tablet. Um, we still have, we, we kept some iPad cards, mm -hmm. um, you know, where we used to sign out laptop cards. We now sign out iPad cards because, you know, I would say that we're device agnostic. I think that, you know, living in kind of both worlds, we've been able to kind of manage that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's been a good, it's been a good mix for kids as well. And I think it's been a good mix for staff. I would also say, if you think about your own devices that you use, you don't use your phone for everything. You don't use your laptop for everything. So not one device out there right now does everything perfectly. So uh, I would have to agree the iPads were, are still important because they have such a strong media, photo, video component, and that's the way they're designed. The Chromebooks, to, from what I see from students, it truly has made a, a connection to college and career and the business world because that's what it functions as, that's what it looks like, it has a professional air also about it, and it does allow students, while I'll be, I tell you, kids are amazing on the iPad. You've re we've really turned those into a work device. However, there are some things that we just couldn't do. Apps that you couldn't, well, you can use, I don't want to keep throwing language out there that if you haven't experienced it yet, but Google add-ons and some other things that you just could not use on, a, on that mobile platform. So, but it has been amazing to see that, how they can move between devices. And I think that's important that they understand what device to use when. And then they're actually learning, I think, a much broader, diverse uh, approach to which device should I use for this product that a teacher has given me, because that's the real world. They're going to get a variety of devices there. Is the Go Guardian thing pretty unique to Chromebooks, or did you have anything similar? So we were looking for something that would be a management from a management system. Apple has, of course, their Apple Classroom. Go Guardian is kind of its answer to that. Uh, one of the other things, and I know it was approved tonight, was Jamf, the ability to be able to track a device. Uh, that was very important when uh, you're asking uh, us to put out over 14 or 1500 devices in a school, uh, and we trust all of our students to, uh, with those devices, but there are those times when, when devices are misplaced. Uh, Go Guardian does allow for us to still be able to find the device. Uh, somewhat similar to what Jamf does and what the, you know, kind of like the find my iPad and not find my iPhone, but that was the one thing that it does allow you to do that was very important, but also the classroom management aspect of that as well was very important. And, and Go Guardian was designed by a former employee of Google, and it was designed for a Google product and a Chromebook. So it works ex exceptionally well for that. And honestly, if, if whatever everyone decides, they go hand in hand. Yeah. Again, this, I'm sorry, it wasn't intended to be our final report. But, uh, I'll get my thought here right. Um, you know, to me, education is more than just learning and to pass a test. And so I guess the ultimate question is, is the use of technology going to help these students learn, retain, and be able to use the knowledge that they do learn in real world situations? Is it, is it worth the money that we're spending? If not, it's a waste of time. So I'll give you two examples. Uh, Pardon me? The, I'm going to give you two examples of why I think it's important. Um, so uh, we needed a student to do some footage of us for a drone, with some drone footage of, of, the, of the building. Um, so this, today, uh, I knew who the student was. I brought the student in. Uh, he took his drone, he brought it in, and he got some footage of North Eggerstown High School. His dad actually lives in my neighborhood, and he came down to me prior and said, hey, I just need to know exactly what you're going to do with it. 
um, and, and we told him what we were doing and why we were doing it. And he said, okay, we'll get the footage. I'll put it on an SD card. I'll give it to you and you can use it. Uh, and his son sat there and he said, well, Dad, I'm not sure. You don't need to do that. I can just drop that into Google. I can pass that on to Mr. Alshire. He'll have it. And it's all that. And his dad looked at me and he was like, I'm still old school. Like, I'll do the SD card, <laughs> which was cool for him to do and for him to talk. But to hear a kid, and this is a sophomore student, have that kind of conversation at that level, that is a real world skill that he'll use. Probably the, the second story I'll say is he brought the drone in today. Uh, and there are five adults who are standing in front of North High uh, at the main entrance. He started the drone. He took it from the front of North Hagerstown High School. He took it over top of North Hagerstown High School. He got the stadium and all the grounds. And then he took it down the walkway because we're including Northern Middle in the video that we're creating. And I said, aren't you going to walk with it? You know, here I'm. He was like, well, no, I, this is going to go four miles. Like, I don't need to walk with it. I can see it. He took his phone out of his pocket. He look, hooked it in. So do I think it's worth the investment? It's the world. Uh, I definitely think it's worth the investment. Um, I think it's important for our kids. I think it puts them on a level that they can compete in a world that is going to be ever-changing. So I definitely believe that the investment is worth it. I mean, I'm being critical or cynical. I right, right. No, I think it's a, good I think it's a fair for. question. I would say you're all, you're all going to wonder that, and the people behind us will do that as well. It's really hard to, to measure that answer, but we all know that quality teachers and quality instruction is what makes a difference in students. But the quality teacher uses discernment and they know what the tools are that are available and technology is one of those tools. And if they see that we can accomplish something more efficiently, we can meet the needs of students who need things for accessibility reasons. Uh, we increase in collaboration, do things in real time. And like James has mentioned, or Mr. Ashar has mentioned, allow them to compete because we know they're going to go out in the world and they're going to be expected to use a variety of software tools and devices and we are I think we're making them more ready for college more ready for careers and that's what our one of our goals has been so, yeah. yeah I find myself being forced more to learn about technology I mm -hmm. go along reluctantly sometimes <laughs> so my so my question and you mentioned the word discernment you're giving PD to teachers and you're teaching them how to learn these things and the best way to apply them in their classrooms um, for student learning. The, stu the teacher has to then go back and teach the students how to use these things. So how are you finding the balance? I mean, we have curriculum that you're to be delivering and there's you know, expectations there. How do teachers find the balance between teaching the technology and teaching their curriculum. I think that's been the that has been the that's been the question I think that we've answered through the use of our tech team uh, when we have decided on what our professional development in-house professional development will look like um, our PLC our teams as as content teams meet in their professional learning communities to talk about curriculum mm -hmm. and to talk about planning but from a professional development standpoint, uh, from a school standpoint, which I'm in charge of, um, and the rest of the team, we look at, we have tools. How can we utilize those tools in a professional development standpoint that they can utilize the tools that we're providing them to combine with the curriculum to then also to be able to work with the students? And I think, you know, our initiative with, the, with Google at the time when we started to scratch the surface and, and, and Lisa and Becky took us through that, we made a decision that we were going to use Google as a school. Um, no one had said that we needed to do that. No one prescribed that we needed to do that. But we thought, you know, it's a lot easier if we're all rowing in the same direction, going the same way. So as a school, we made that commitment. We made that commitment through professional development at the school level as well. And we trained teachers because we thought it was important utilizing Google Classroom uh, for students to be able to get assignments and for, and for parents to be able to see uh, what is going on in a teacher's classroom. Those things were all important, but they were tools that we embedded with the curriculum that we have. So we didn't take the power away from teachers and understanding the curriculum and utilizing the curriculum. We wanted to take the tools that we have to help them to save time. To, and so and there are a lot of things that we've been able to do as a result of that 
but that has been part of it has been a key part of having the technology team uh, and it's buy-in from teachers like I'm not up in front leading all the professional development you know on November 6 when we had professional development at the school um, you know Kara and Adam and Bob um, and Daryl said what, what's our role this day I said we're gonna sign up for sessions like every teacher and we're going to go through the sessions with our teachers leading the professional development so that we can see how they're using the technology with the curriculum and what they're doing with kids so when we're walking in the classrooms we know what's going on um, so it's just evolved as a result of kind of that vision and that shared vision from within the school and I would add too the teachers they don't really have to teach much to the students I know when they did the Chromebook rollout they went through the English departments and they trained the students on key things on the keyboard and different things like that and after that the kids just took off running um, they know the devices pretty well uh, and I would say sometimes they show you while you're teaching did you ever know it did this and then you you've been taught as well so I would say that um, all of the devices are student friendly for that purpose and I think what makes it I don't want to say the word easier but I am is when teachers see something that does what they need it to do there's an excitement there's a willingness to make time and the G Suite the Google Suite that's the classroom and all the apps that go with it was really I think one of the first things that we focused on as James mentioned because it it did so many things immediately that we needed whether it be providing resources or offer the means to collaborate in live time and and that sort of thing and I I think after that it was really PD should be diverse and I think between the team here and Mike that's really what we created with James leadership and philosophy and the support of Lisa and Mike and of course you all we and the and then the team we've been able to deliver PD in a variety of different formats whether it was immediate I have an extra planning time period during the day whether it was during the PLCs after school smaller groups whether it was we planned our PD on our PD days or little bits here and there I think that diversity also helped to create the balance quickly yes. was there any let me get this I apologize because I'm a fan I you know it's a tool and a device that I thought you know high school students definitely needed something beyond the you know the, the iPad um, was there any difficulty for kids to transition from using an iPad for the years that they've been doing it to you know this type of device personally I like those better be truthful with you feel, feel like I can do more with business than I can I had kids running into my office telling me how much they love the Chromebooks they I mean, this oh, is their world. They're yeah. te they're tech kids, so the the transition from the iPad to the Chromebook was seamless for the students. It, but it about, was more for us. How about it was more difficult for us. Care, you, know, you said it's it's their world, and I agree. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why I was happy when we decided to make this this, uh, this move. And, and their world would have been. Yeah. They were probably the same when we, when, yeah, we were there also on the front lines when we gave out the first iPad to kids as well. You know, I think, you know, it levels the playing. The other thing is it levels the playing field for kids. You know, every kid has a device. Every kid can work at the same level. Every student has the ability. So, I, I, it, to me, devices, devices, device. I mean, because we, we, I would say as collectively as a school, and I would say with our staff and with our our students we would say that we thought we were doing a pretty good job when we were asked to roll the iPads out and we were making what we needed to do and we were finding out how to do what we wanted it to do and all that kind of other good stuff and the Chromebook the I think we were more concerned probably about the transition for teachers than we were for students uh, but I think when you see that 50 teachers are coming in before the start of school to pick up their device to make sure that has been kind of awesome just to watch. See, um, I think too that this is a device they're going to use going on more so than an iPad, you know, laptop, Chromebook, whatever the case might be. Uh, do you guys feel 
similar to that, or do you think you know I pay it? I think it. I think honestly, I think it depends. I don't. <coughs> I don't think that we. I, I think it would be tough. I mean, I watched a student today take his iPhone out to utilize the drone, and you know. If he had the iPad, he would be dropping it into iMovie and clipping it and cutting it and doing all those different things. Um, not that he can't do the same thing with a Chromebook, but I just think I think it depends on where they are and where they're going to go and how it's going to be utilized and what it's going to be utilized for. Um, so that's why I would say I think it's it's good for students to have multiple devices to be able to use. That's why we didn't dump all the iPads. Like we said, hey, we wanted to keep iPads because we still find that they're important. There are days that you can walk through North High and you're going to come through the hallways and you're going to see kids. Their Chromebooks will be sitting in the classroom, but they're on the cart of iPads. The teacher's probably signed out and they're making videos in the hallways or they're out on the grounds and they're doing different things. Um, not to say that the Chromebook can't do it, but the way in which the iPad works with that is different. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 it's, it's, yeah, it's back and forth. There's just, you know, I don't think it would I be <coughs> device the specific. The plan right now is we plan to purchase Chromebooks for another high school. Uh, so we want to pilot that a little bit, but we're also going to uh, purchase some clamshells for the iPads, which in essence is a keyboard with the uh, iPad, which is really the part that I'd like to see utilized is the, the need to see students using keyboards rather than either a split screen or, or some other you know, right. way that they can't see everything. So I appreciate the team coming tonight and sharing. Obviously, they'll have uh, six more months of work yet to do, and we'll, we'll hear back from them as the year goes on. I also want to recognize Dr. Kahanek and his work and support uh, prior to his transition to Boonesboro. He was a big part of this effort and still keeps his uh, finger in here a little bit and helps us out. So appreciate his efforts and the team's efforts as well. Thank, so, you. thank you. Thank you for supporting us. and. Choosing us. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. For our next report, I'm going to ask Dr. Pugh to come forward with some team members. Uh, very, very exciting. This is, uh, you know, we've gotten off to a great day with uh, Sharpsburg Elementary School, but, uh, and, uh, you know, a couple of great reports, and obviously our AP scholars were exciting, but this is equally as exciting. Uh, we have a couple of new programs that uh, we've talked about here a little bit. Uh, but tonight we're going to officially kind of kick them off, give a timeline to it, a little bit of a description to it, and um, some more information will follow from there. So, Dr. Pugh, are you first up? We are. We're All ready. Right. Good evening, President Williams, Vice President Stauffer, Dr. Michael, and members of the board. If you recall, Dr. Michael's initial charge was to envision the future and begin to prepare for this rapidly changing world that our students will be living and working in. Um, this work began in January of 2018, so a full year ago, with internal and external discussions through several public forums to get information from our teachers, our students, business and industry, and parents um, around current offerings and what the workforce needed um, in order to create a comp comprehensive plan for our students that encompassed two outcomes. The first outcome was to provide access to computational thinking as a literacy for all. We brought to you that presentation in October. And then the second was to develop new or expanded technology-related high-value career pathways for students. With me today to share some exciting news about that second outcome is Rodney Gaiman is our principal at Washington County Technical High School, Dr. Rob Hovermel, principal at Barbara Ingram School for the Arts, and Cody Pine, supervisor for career and technology education. In the fall of 2020, Washington County Technical High School will be introducing two new advanced programs to meet the growing needs of industry and to help students prepare for post-secondary opportunities. These programs were developed through partnerships with local businesses, higher education, and the Maryland State Department of Education. These state-of-the-art programs are artificial intelligence, cloud computing, and advanced manufacturing. Artificial intelligence involves the programming of machines to receive large volumes of data and learn to produce an output quickly and efficiently. The national curriculum aligns with our post-secondary partners to meet the industry needs and provide high-value career pathways for our students. This would be the first AI cloud computing program offered in Maryland public schools. Advanced manufacturing uses the engineering design process to create manufactured products 
to industry specifications through the use of computer numerical controlled machines and robots. The program also uses a national recognized curriculum leading to numerous industry and post-secondary recognized certifications in robotics, manufacturing, and statistical quality control. AI cloud computing is extremely rare at the high school level, but we feel with all confidence that our students are capable of earning cloud certifications through the latest Cisco curriculum. Uh, the cloud refers to a virtual external database. So I'm going to give you a very quick crude example. If you have an iPhone, your iPhone has data and it has memory. And when you take pictures, you start using the memory of your phone. If you have iCloud, you can export those photos to iCloud, which doesn't use the data in your phone and allows your phone to work properly and your apps to work properly. That's so that's a very, very simplified version of, of cloud computing. Um, artificial intelligence and specifically cloud computing brings together networking, security, analytics, and management to certify students in these essential concepts. Students in this program will develop cloud solutions to create and manage private, hybrid, or public clouds. So students will not only be working on simplistic things, students will be working on holistic things that can be shared publicly, or it can be kept private, or it can be a hybrid of both. Um, students will also learn how to program machines that can create solutions through artificial intelligence and machine learning methods. Manufacturing is a leading industry that has changed drastically in the past few years, and it's expected to continue to expand through artificial intelligence and specifically the use of robotics and smart factory technologies. Advanced manufacturing leads to entry-level certification in manufacturing and machine technologies and aligns to the National Institute of Metalworking Skills, acronym NEMS, uh, machining curriculum for certification. Students participate in cutting edge precision machining using robotics while developing competency in computer numeric control processes and programming. So if you'll if you take a look at the slide, you'll see in the middle there are CNC machines. On the, on the right, there are robotics that are interacting. And on the left, you will see a smart factory uh, integrating programmable logic control, which controls robots, which in turn uh, works with the computer numeric control machine to take a raw product and give you a finished product at the end, all through automation. Upon the completion of this program, students will have a national manufacturing certification, making them marketable in any state in the nation for a high value career beyond high school. Barb Ingram School for the Arts is uh, very excited to announce that in the fall of 2020, when the new facility is opened, we will have expanded and updated courses for current and recruited students. We're excited to bring the computer game development and animation and digital communication programs to our students as they merge new technologies in the arts. These courses and programs will give students opportunities to assess or access a career technology education program completer and or to explore technical electives in their area of interest. As we enter our second decade here at BISFA, these programs will work hand in hand with the existing performing and creative arts to create a natural collaboration as the school continues its mission and vision of a college prep culture of excellence. Future game developers learn a traditional C-sharp coding along with modern visual scripting languages to create models for solutions to perform and to bring original storyboards for computer games to virtual life. Students work with the latest industry-leading 3D modeling and animation software from Autodesk to create stunning models and animations. They also create audio compositions, musical scores, and foley or sound effects for all games and programs. Students often work in groups to solve large real-world problems such as our students built a virtual reality paint spraying operation for our collision repair program in which they actually have the 3D goggles, they use the 3D wear. It's a really amazing project, really high tech. Digital Communications is a comprehensive digital media program with an emphasis on photography as well as general video production. The program is designed to provide training in video and television production and it includes fashion and portrait photography. In recent years, filmmaking has been democratized with the development of low-cost digital cinema cameras and sound recording equipment. So as a result, 
uh, our digital communications continually evolves to keep up with the emerging technologies as it advances. In addition, we will be looking to add teachers who are specially trained in working with students in a virtual setting. These teachers will begin offering expanded blended learning courses, which can allow greater flexibility in both time and scheduling for students and schools. Blended learning, if you remember, students receive minimally 20% of their instruction face-to-face -face and 80% is done uh, independently. These trained digital learning teachers would have the responsibility of monitoring and supporting students so that should they need additional support that they could pull them in um, for that. The Teachers actually have a, a, a course that they have to take in order to be certified. We're looking at expanding it in the content areas as well as expanding our current offerings that we have for um, foundations of technology and for our health courses. Um, these programs we hope to open with the coinciding of the 2020 to expand our virtual footprint for self-motivated students so that they have access to courseware um, without the restrictions of walls. So at this point, we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Mr. Stelter. Uh, and I haven't kept up with this, so please uh, pardon my ignorance, but uh, years ago when I taught at Williamsport, it was designated the Manufacturing Academy. Is that still a designation out there, or is that passe? Or Right now we uh, use the Project Lead the Way curriculum and with the pre-engineering um, stance. We do teach one class of computer integrated manufacturing, but it's not the traditional manufacturing academy. Okay. So is it still designated the manufacturing academy? It is not. Okay. So these courses wouldn't be offered there. They'd have to go to tech or this stuff for them. Okay. The new expanded uh, courses would be um, high tech. Uh, um, uh, it, it would be more automated, more computer, more artificial intelligence. So they, those don't exist. I just have some things I've been thinking about. Um, do the students that attend Tech High, do they um, participate in sports and clubs in their home schools? Yes, they do. Okay, well what about the Barbara Ingram, if they would go into a program, one of these programs at Barbara Ingram, since they're traditionally a later school, would they still have that opportunity to be in sports and clubs and things? They would become members of Barbara Ingram School for the Arts, and that would be a, a slow transition to that point. Uh, it would actually be going from a two-year program to a four-year program, and just like the Barbara Ingram School, it would be a, an hour longer, so they, they wouldn't have uh, the, the same ac um, accessibility that they have now, but they would have access to that if they wanted to. We have a few students at Barbara Ingram that take part in sports at their home schools. So we're very excited <clears throat> about the additions that we're going to have to Barbara Ingram in 2020. I think it's just going to bring another dynamic to Barbara Ingram. If you watch the students that are in the game uh, design and the media production, um, I mean, they are true artists uh, in every sense of the imagination. I mean, visually and, and audible and, and how they create the things they do, I just can't even imagine. Much like when I watch many of uh, Rob's art students or hear them sing or play uh, or act, uh, it's truly an art form. Uh, we're very excited about the technology earlier. Mr. Stafford, you mentioned about, granted, we were talking about Chromebooks and iPads and things like that, but this technology is just beyond what I would have ever imagined would happen in high school, and I think it's going to be really, really exciting. Um, so we're excited about the two new programs. We're excited about the expansion of Barbara Ingram. Uh, I think this is really going to move our students forward. I can imagine our students coming out of high school ready for high paying jobs right out of high school with certifications uh, like many of them do already at many of our schools including Tech High but these two new programs are going to add even a capstone to that yet. It was interesting Mr. Pine shared with me an article uh, I guess that was just Friday or the weekend uh, on engineering and talked about a part that um, a certain organization need at one time it'd be three or four months to have the, man the part uh, manufactured or machined and at this point, we're looking at technology that will print parts, large parts, uh, in a matter of 16 or 17 hours. That's what the world's going to come to. At one time, a machinist would take you know, a long time to uh, prepare and analyze and engineers to design things. Now it's going to be done on a computer and a, you know, maybe something that's an old part, an outdated part, will actually be printed and used 
in a mechanism. I mean, it's beyond imagination in some ways, but uh, we're really excited about the possibilities. An upcoming event we're going to have for the board, we'll share a little bit more about this in the future, is what's happening at our engineering lab at our innovation center over at Tech High. That's in addition to these programs we're talking about. And we're going to have an open house in February with that program. You're going to be very excited to see some of the um, new equipment and some of the offerings we have there as well. So if there are any other questions, <coughs> thank you, team, for sharing tonight, and there'll be much more to come. This is very <coughs> exciting for Washington County. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all I have for the evening, Professor Williams. Hey, thank you, Dr. Michael. So we'll move to personnel, personnel action. Dr. Bishop. Good evening, board members. As discussed earlier in closed session, there are several staff changes for your review tonight. At this time, I ask for your, per for your approval of today's personnel actions. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. Is there a motion? Move for approval. Thank okay. you. Second. Thank you. The motion is for approval of personnel action as discussed in our closed session earlier this afternoon. All those in favor? Okay, we're unanimous. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, reports to the board. Mr. Mackey, would you like to begin? Earlier as many of you know, the Washington County Association of Student Councils met. Um, it was our third General Assembly meeting of the year, and uh, we had an information panel led by uh, Dr. Pugh um, where students could ask questions about new initiatives <coughs> underway in Washington County Public Schools. And then um, in the afternoon, we hosted um, leadership workshops for the students. And um, our next General Assembly meeting will be March 12th, and that That'll be the meeting where we hold elections for the next year student member of the Board of Education. So, uh, wow. Wow. We're ready? Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, uh, yeah, we're getting ready to wrap it up, I guess. Oh, but, goodness. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mackley. Okay, nothing for curriculum instruction. Finance? Uh, finance committee will meet on uh, January 29th at 8 a.m. Human Resources Committee? Yes, we, have that. we will meet. Terry sent me a message, said the 22nd. I don't think that's correct. I think it's going to be the 29th, but it'll be at 9.15. I'll try to get that cleared up. Okay, thank you. And Mrs. Fisher isn't here to talk about policy review and development. Facilities, Mr. Gasford, I couldn't get that word out. Um, right now, we have not had a meeting uh, due to the um, holiday um, break, and um, we will probably be meeting, our next meeting will be in February. So um, it will either be the first Tuesday or the second Tuesday I need to talk with Mr. Pru. And it will be an 8 o'clock meeting. Anything about the legislative response team? Mr. Stauffer, did you want to uh, speak to meet, that? Uh, we'll meet Friday afternoon at 2.30. Okay. Thank you. Under miscellaneous business, we have consideration of future agenda items. Uh, we have a list of some listed our four legislative briefings. Um, our legislative session for the state of Maryland began um, a day or so ago. So we have uh, briefings set up for February, March, April, and May. I think it starts Thursday. It starts Thursday? I thought it already started. Yeah, Maybe they're just... It starts this Thursday. I think okay. Maybe. Thank you for correcting me, Mr. Stauffer. Um, at our upcoming um, January 22nd meeting, we have several uh, reports under the superintendent's report, recognition of National Merit Scholarship commended students, 
Uh, we're going to be recognizing some students um, for their eGate portfolios, and um, we have a report on the kindergarten readiness assessment. We'll have an update on that. Coming up on February 5th, we have a possible work session. We didn't discuss that. We have on our um, budget calendar scheduled a second work session. We've already had one. So my question to my colleagues would be, um, are we in need of a second work session on the superintendent's FY 2020 recommended budget? We have, anyone have more questions or the need for additional information? Is this something that we want to schedule or we want to dispense with this workshop? I think we work session. Sorry. I, I think we should wait until we know something from the state. I think that's the bottom line right now. We, we have to know how much money we're going to have from them so we can start making some decisions based on that. So We should know that prior to the 22nd so maybe we can make a final decision on January 22nd regarding the work session on the 5th. On Correct. the 5th? So we'll wait to the 22nd to make a final decision? Okay. And so that's that's what we have coming up. I, so I want we'll, to correct myself. Yes, sir. Yeah, the session starts tomorrow. I was thinking the day was the seventh. It starts on the ninth, which is tomorrow. I'm old. I get mixed up, you know. Usually. As do I. I thought it. I thought I read that it already yeah, started. It starts tomorrow. The they're down there doing good stuff already. I think meeting and. Oh yeah. Yeah, meeting and doing all the things that they do. Hopefully they're doing good stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so on to board member comments. Let's start at the opposite end. Mr. Reiner, do you have anything for us this evening? I have nothing this evening. Nothing? The only thing I have is uh, that last night I attended the uh, celebration of the Books for Babies program that um, it's basically celebrated 20 years and has given out 30,000 books yeah. to newborns. And I'd applaud... Um, uh, President Williams, because she was one of the uh, on the reading you council. Found, yeah, you helped found that um, that service, and it was a pleasure to be there last night with Dr. Michael. And and what, what was really neat is when several of the children brought the book that they received when they were newborns. Oh. Yeah, yep. so really neat. They event. still have it. Oh, is that wonderful? Yeah, they still have it. Yep. That's wonderful. That's great. I was just pleased to be invited to North High this past Saturday to help um, give out the awards at the Hub Cup Invitational, the Wrestling Invitational, and it was exciting to be there, and I thank them for the invitation. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Okay. Um, I'd just like to say that I thought we had a beautiful day for um, our groundbreaking ceremony at Sharpsburg Elementary School, and I'm so excited um, to watch that school take form. I'm excited for the communities that will be sending their students to the new Sharpsburg um, Elementary School. So it was a great day, great day. Anyone else have any comments before I adjourn the meeting? No? Okay, then we stand adjourned. Thank you.